President and CEO of Genome Canada. The short answer is that we have a large number of uh, talented and committed researchers across the country who are working long hours um, and with, with great uh, commitment and focus on developing new tests, uh, new responses, and new treatments for this. So we're very well equipped in that way. Canada is a world leader when it comes to health-related genomics research. Uh, it was actually a Canadian group who sequenced the SARS genome back in 2003, and that group and many others are uh, using what we learned from that case to actually tackle the coronavirus uh, we have today. The number one priority is clearly um, the uh, uh, care and protection of patients and the uh, safety of our frontline health personnel. So obviously we need to make sure that we're making a lot of investments in, you know, uh, protective equipment, safety protocols, uh, you know, treatment processes and so on. So that's obviously the number one area of focus. Uh, after that, really, I'd say that the big, uh, the big need right now when it comes to the research side is to develop um, rapid testing. Um, point of care testing so that we can actually go to the bedside of quarantined patients and we can actually get test results very quickly. That will really allow us to help both um, uh, sort of identify sick patients, but also track uh, the disease progression. So, so rapid diagnostics is a major area of focus. Of course, after that, we shift to uh, treatments and therapeutics. And here we're talking about both vaccines and, and drugs. And, and those are, are, are probably a little more long term in terms of their uh, impact. But it's important we get that work started now. And there are potentially areas where we can, um, you know, hopefully find some shortcuts to, uh, to speed those up. What we're seeing now is, 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 is probably an appropriate response, which is that we're actually finding a lot of uh, different approaches across the country and around the world. And what we really need is actually a lot of different people trying a lot of different things in order to identify what works. Uh, leadership is clearly important, and uh, you know I, I give full marks to the federal government for and and the provincial governments for um, being open and communicative about um, about their intentions and by taking bold action. And so leadership matters, but at the same time, I would say uh, community driven responses um, led by researchers who are. Um, open with their results, sharing their data and information, and working <clears throat> collaboratively across borders is really going to be the key to helping us find the quickest way to solve this crisis. I have to say that I am I am impressed with what I've seen so far in terms of community response. And I think that certainly the private sector is uh, is looking for ways to get involved on the research side of things. We, we know of a number of collaborations involving both academic and government scientists, as well as companies who may well, who are going to be essential in the terms of production of any vaccine or drug that comes along. So those kinds of collaborations are going to be absolutely uh, essential. But of course, this isn't simply a medical crisis. Uh, the medical crisis is, 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 is in a sense, uh, blooming into other areas. You know, I, I think that there's the, the actual, um, the coronavirus itself, we need to figure out solutions for, but there will be enormous psychosocial impacts, for instance. And so we need to be thinking about mental health issues, and that's going to involve a different set of uh, both healthcare providers as well as community supports. We know there's going to there's already a lot of economic disruption, so it's a it really is a multifaceted um, uh, challenge that's going to require everybody to be thinking about how they can contribute to the impact beyond simply looking at uh, at the impact of the the virus itself. So genomics really is. Um, a field of study that looks at how all the molecular systems work together inside living things. And so that that starts with the genome, which is the which is the the, the DNA inside an organism. But it it goes beyond that now then into how how the DNA translates into all the other molecular systems inside of uh, of living things. Chinese scientists were able to uh, sequence the COVID-19 uh, uh, genome in just 10 days. We, When we sequenced the SARS genome, it took us several weeks. So within 10 days, we actually had the blueprint of DNA uh, that the uh, coronavirus um, has, and that that helps us in a number of ways. First, it allows us to uh, you know take a few guesses as to how the the virus actually works, and uh, point a way towards understanding transmission, which helps us um, come up with strategies for containment uh, and 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 so on. Uh, secondly, having the viral genome um, gives us a target to look for when we're looking at diagnostics. So it opens uh, the door to a variety of methods to improve diagnostics and to do so in a way that's um, that's potentially very quick.
Uh, the third thing is, of course, it provides um, a number of potential targets for uh, vaccine development and possible drug uh, drug development. Uh, so, so at a very basic level, even just having the coronavirus genome uh, opens up lots of opportunities. And then we layer on top of that, we have we have very clever people working on a number of things. You know, for instance, how the the, the coronavirus genome interacts with uh, with with patient uh, genomes and other systems in order to understand why it is that some patients seem to get very very sick and others others don't. Uh, so those are those are important questions and. Solving those kinds of um, questions may well open the door for uh, possible uh, lines of attack in terms of therapy and so on. The federal government, right out of the gate, um, was very quick, I would say, in, in trying to respond on the on a research level to the challenges um, being being created by the coronavirus. Uh, early on, we got involved in a coordinated effort with a variety of other uh, federal uh, organizations. Uh, including uh, CIHR, uh, NSERC, um, the Social Sciences and Humanities Council, as well as uh, the IDRC, in a coordinated effort to uh, f fund a first round of projects that would try to mount a rapid response to the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, a, a variety of, of really fascinating projects came out of that. Um, the one I'll focus on is, uh, is, is, a, is a project we're funding at the University of Calgary led by Dr. Dylan Pillai, which is really focused on uh, developing uh, rapid diagnostics. And, and his team is, is looking to build um, a portable uh, diagnostic tool uh, that could be handheld and actually brought to the bedside of quarantined patients um, and could be used, uh, used globally. And so uh, it's a really innovative approach to, to developing those tests and, and, and we're quite hopeful that uh, that, that work will, will yield positive results and as well as a, a, the other couple dozen projects that got seeded across the country. It's about where we can contribute most meaningfully. And we know that in Canada, we have um, we have some unique challenges that are posed by our, our geography, for instance. And uh, there may be unique challenges posed by, you know, uh, populations unique to Canada. Um, and so we need to be solving or addressing some of those unique challenges while at the same time contributing to global efforts. Uh, you know, one of the things about these pandemics, of course, is that as the virus spreads, it, it changes and it mutates and um, takes on, you know, potentially uh, different uh, behaviors. And so we need to make sure that we are contributing globally to, um, uh, to, to data sets, to uh, information sets so that we can look not, not simply at what's happening in a single hospital or in a single province, but really globally, how is our experience comparing to that experience in the United States, Italy, China, South Korea, and so on. The scientists are better coordinated than a lot of the institutions. Um, you know, we work, we work certainly hard to connect with our international partners, and I've been in touch with my colleagues in, um, in, in other countries, but it's the scientists who are actually on the ground doing the work, who know who they need to speak to, who the expert is that can help them at a given time, who needs to know the results of the experiments they're running. And so, you know, science really is a community organization, um, a community-led, organ uh, sorry, a community-led activity. And uh, the community is really committed here. And so our job as, um, as funding institutions and so on, is in many ways to put wind in their sails. Uh, so there's there's a bit of a, a there's a, a two kind of a, a, a double sided approach here. On the one hand, we want to demonstrate leadership by you know helping provide um, coordination, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we are just providing the scientists the tools they need to to address the the problem amongst themselves. And within that, there's there's a little bit of a lesson, and I think <clears throat> it's it's important for us to you know. As a, as a take home lesson here is that we are mounting a, a very impressive response globally to this crisis. But the reason we can do that is because we have been funding scientists um, for, you know, for decades, virologists who are, you know, working away and training, training students and um, uh, pushing the envelope in terms of technologies and, and, and understanding. And when the crisis hits, they're ready to respond. Uh, so, you know, there's both the rapid response element to this that's that's absolutely essential, but there's also just a background level of activity that we need to make sure that we have, um, you know, that, that's healthy and strong so that when crises do come up, we actually have a community of scientists or other types of researchers ready to respond and, and jump into action. Nobody has the the definite answer as to when we'll find some kind of cure or treatment. I, first, what we're going to see, and I'm and I'm very confident about this, 
are real um, increases in our ability to do effective and rapid testing. And that's, that, that is essential. I mean, we really do need uh, quicker testing so that um, we can do more widespread testing and really get a better and clearer sense of, of what we're dealing with. Uh, after that, I think we're going to see some, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we will see uh, significant improvements just in medical treatment of those who are uh, infected by the uh, coronavirus. Um, and so that we can, you know, we can help uh, reduce um, mortality. And, and I think that we're going to see that. When it comes to actual vaccine and cure development, these things take time. And, and so, you know, we, we hear numbers, you know, 18 months to two years. Having said that, you know, there are some, uh, you know, some innovative approaches uh, that may may well short circuit that a little bit and we may get something a little quicker. And there are a number of people looking at uh, repurposing existing drugs, for instance, uh, other, um, you know, uh, antivirals and so on, uh, those tests, you know, it, we don't know for sure, but it may well be that uh, that there is some impact from from existing uh, treatments that could actually also help provide a shortcut to uh, to some kind of treatment. Again, and this is about having that diverse community approach. You have the researchers who are going to say, okay, I'm aiming at the 18 month vaccine and I'm going to just make sure every day I get us closer to that. And then you have other researchers who say, okay, good. If you've got that on lockdown, then I will take a bit more of a risky approach and try to screen existing drugs, for instance. And then you have others who say, okay, if you are all doing that, then I'm going to look at how we might actually target, say, the uh, the human human targets to see if we can somehow block the the, the virus. So there's a lot of different approaches being taken, and um, you know, our hope is that. Uh, and our expectation is that there will be a, a variety of um, of successes that will help get us closer to actually um, managing this effectively. Yes, this will certainly happen again. I mean, the, you know, we are we are creatures of biology, and um, you know, it's important to uh, you know for for all of our progress. Um, we remain um, at the at the whims of biological process, and so um, there have always been human pandemics, and and there will likely always be human pandemics. Having said that, um, you know we are much better positioned today to deal with this outbreak than we were to deal with the SARS outbreak, and we were better positioned to deal with the SARS outbreak than we were to deal with the Spanish flu, and so on and so forth. And so every time we we learn a little more, we get a little better. Um, but uh, but the fact is that um, you know. Humans are uh, are biological creatures, and as such, we are uh, prone to the um, you know the afflictions that have uh, that have plagued us for centuries. You know, the areas where I'm uh, where I'm more comfortable really are around kind of the research uh, area and the um, you know the application of you know kind of uh, the, the research results. I'd say that you know the the. The lessons here are that we have a strong, committed, talented community that are ready to respond. Um, that's phenomenal. Uh, I, I give full marks to the government, federal government and provincial governments for um, acting very quickly in terms of uh, making new funds available and being very open to ideas from the community about how to, how to move forward. That's all really great. Um, going forward, I think that, you know, there is a risk there's been there have been challenges with regards to um, sustained funding for uh, what's considered you know basic research or, or fundamental research, which uh, which is which is basic and fundamental uh, until a crisis like this hits and suddenly you're um, you know the virologist looking at uh, mechanisms for um, viral transmission doesn't that science doesn't seem so arcane anymore suddenly it seems very germane and so. We need, I think, to to recognize the value of making good long-term sustained investments, and that it serves it serves society. The, the the second thing I'll say is that you know I think that we're we're living in a world of uh, of data, and the healthcare system is uh, not unique in its challenges with managing um, large quantities of data and moving that data around efficiently, effectively, but also with um, with with you know with appropriate controls and so on. So I think, you know, going forward for me, I think it will be really important for us to think about how we can make sure that hospitals and research institutions are able to collect data from patients and using, you know, and from their, um, the, 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 the various, you know, so in this case here, viral strains and so on, and then make that data available across provincial borders, across national borders, so that we can actually work collectively and together. That's a, that's a policy challenge. And that's one that's well understood and recognized, but one that's not, not as simple to uh, to solve as as we might hope.
it is hard to look sometimes for the silver lining given the challenges we're facing. Um, but certainly, you know, I well, just personally, I'm inspired by the commitment I'm seeing among Canadians and and internationally um, to come together and to work collectively to try to um, to try to minimize the impact of the pandemic. And and here I'm thinking about everything from you know. Uh, organizations uh, deciding to uh, self-isolate and work from home, um, individuals, uh, you know, making sure that they're not going to be congregating, giving up, you know, giving up trips and um, and activities that they may well have been looking forward to for for, for months or years. Um, so the, the commitment, and then on top of that, the, the commitment of, of workers who do go into work every day and continue to uh, work in our, in our, in our nursing homes, in our hospitals, in our um, fast food places and all, you know, so I think that that um, to me, it, it's, it brings home the value of community and the commitment that we, we share in that regard. So I think that's a big silver lining more, more, more directly in terms of my area. The silver lining is a reminder of just how strong we are in research that Canada can be, uh, you know, it is among the leaders globally and is playing an important role in, in addressing uh, these challenges. And it's, you know, the last several years have been uh, sometimes challenging for science. And there's a lot of, um, you know, the uh, sort of fake news and uh, misinformation on the web and, you know, anti-vaccination. And there's a lot, you know, so there's been a lot of challenges with regards to the role science plays in people's everyday lives. But what we're seeing today is that, um, you know, when it, when it comes to a, a real global crisis like this, science can lead and science does lead. Uh, and and will help uh, provide or will provide the tools that we then can use to try to get out, get out of this uh, this difficult time. I've been uh, so you know working from home obviously, but also uh, using this time to get caught up on on some reading. So doing a lot of reading. Um, have been uh, been actually hanging out with my teenage kids, which is great, and introducing them to a lot of, uh, we've actually been watching uh, old Kung Fu movies from the 70s and 80s, which has been great. Uh, and then uh, and then Genome Canada has been building a, uh, a, a playlist of, of shut-in music. And so that's been providing the soundtrack for a lot of the work that we're doing uh, here at our house. I'm Rob Annan, and this is My Future Economy.